do it in a way that that um, uh, shows faith and love. That is a response in Christ Jesus. And then he adds, by the Holy Spirit who guards us, who dwells within us, to guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And that deposit here is what uh, we would call the content of faith and the faith. This is what um, uh, Paul is confessing to Timothy and what he's encouraging Timothy to continue to confess. That good deposit, that, that centrality of the Christian faith and life. And it's all centered in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on to tell Timothy in verse um, 15, You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. What is the meaning of that phrase there, on that day? The final day? Yes, this is the, or better, perhaps the final return of Christ. The day when Christ returns in full glory and power. And I think it's very fitting that that falls on the day, uh, or at least in the season, uh, we are reading this when we are reminded of our Lord's imminent, imminent return. Any questions or comments on that? Uh, we will get this more in chapter 2, which we will go to if there are no more questions. He expands on that further. Okay. Chapter 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Let's just look at those first two verses there. Um, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You know, pastors spend a lot of time studying the scriptures. And as one of my professors, uh, my wife is fond of reminding me of this, reminded her uh, when she was, when I was at the seminary, uh, they had pastor's wives classes as well. And uh, he, said, he said to the pastor's wives, now you remember when your husband is gone to another meeting at church, he's probably the only one there getting paid to be there. <laughs> and there's some truth to that. <laughs> Everyone else is a volunteer in that sense of the term. Um, so, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Because pastors are studying the scriptures for Bible classes, they're studying the scriptures for sermons, they're studying the scriptures. Sometimes that becomes their devotional life. And I have to confess that many times that has been the case for me, um, rather than uh, a separate time, a time set aside for letting the Lord speak to me through, through His Word, as He does all the time, but not so that I can proclaim it to others, but so that it will settle more in me. And by the way, uh, pastors also uh, learn that the first person you preach the sermon to is the guy you see in the mirror. Okay, you preach that sermon first to him, and and if it goes, if it flies there, it may fly in front of the congregation too. I, I think that's good advice. But we also see something else here, beginning with verse two. What you have heard from me, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We have to understand this reality, that the scriptures at the time of Paul, that Paul was writing this to Timothy, consisted of what today we call the Old Testament. There were letters of Paul that were floating around. There were some 
Gospels that have been there, the Gospel of Matthew and probably Mark, uh, might have been there already at this time. But they were not well known. Um, uh, uh, the rest of the New Testament was not well known. Uh, in the Gentile churches, many knew of Paul. Are you looking for sheets? Um, Bruce, do you have, will I have any extra? I'll make some copies. Sorry, Diane, I wasn't paying attention. Um, but here I think we see how the early New Testament church lived. And, and they lived by this. The apostles gathered around them faithful Christians whom they instructed in the words of the Lord. Now, if you go to John's Gospel, John 14, 15, and 16, consistently, uh, Jesus says something like this. When I leave you, the Holy Spirit will come. And then he goes on to say what the Holy Spirit will do. He will bring to your mind everything that I have taught you. Now, uh, the early church believes that Paul was instructed in a three-year period, his Damascus time, uh, or post-Damascus time, not by Ananias, but by Christ himself. And at that time, he was appointed an apostle uh, by Christ. And um, while we have no biblical reference to that, we certainly have a lot of New Testament history that speaks that way, um, and early church history, probably better to say it that way. And so uh, the apostles would sort of have their, their own uh, catechetical classes. And they would gather faithful Christian men, and they would instruct them in the faith, and then send them out to various places. And, and they would go to this church or that congregation, and so on and so forth. And uh, this lasted probably until the mid-70s, uh, 60s or 70s, uh, and then uh, the, the church began to find other ways through its bishops. Um, to find other pastors. And Timothy, you remember, was a bishop. Uh, and what I mean by that, he was a local parish pastor. And that word bishop has two meanings. It has a biblical meaning, which literally means uh, the overseer of a congregation. Okay? Appoint faithful bishops in every place, Paul says to Timothy. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, etc., etc. And so um, that, that word bishop simply meant the, the head of a parish, or the head of a congregation, as we might think of it today. So in that congregation, you, uh, they might have had, uh, say, two other pastors. That sounds so strange. Do you know any congregations like that? <laughs> um, but if we were to apply that here, uh, Bishop Peppercorn, okay, with two pastors, all right, that, that would be the picture that was very similar to the early church. The, he's the guy, he's the one who is in, responsible for what is taught, what is heard, what is proclaimed, and he's the one who is responsible for seeing to it that it is done on the level of Scripture. That it, it does not teach what Scripture does not teach, nor does it neglect what Scripture teaches. That's one of his jobs. Okay? It's a multifaceted job, but it's there nonetheless. Um, I think all of us today probably are on the out, uh, lookout, maybe a better term, Look out for uh, men who, who might be able to serve their Lord in the pastoral office and offer them encouragement, maybe financial support or something like that, so that they can go to the seminaries, which now are located in different places than a local parish congregation. In the early church, the seminary was in the, in the parish. And their people would usually be selected from there uh, who would be called to help and assist the pastor. Because the church was so spread out, um, how did they all preach at the 
same thing. Well, and, and, and here, I think we're getting to this the same way Paul is trying to say here, Mary. Mary's question is, because the church was so spread out, how did they all preach the truth, let's say? Well, they didn't. Okay. Um, Paul, Paul says, watch out for these two. Uh, he gives names. They, they are endeavoring to lead people astray. Um, and it, it was already uh, in the first century, or, or when Christianity was, was very young, um, already Arianism was finding its way into the church. And that hung around until the fifth century. Okay, when the Athanasian Creed finally said, thus far and no farther. And uh, so when we want things fixed today, okay, <laughs> that's an American concept, or at least a 20th, 21st century concept. Um, the early church struggled for literally centuries dealing with the same issue. The issue of the uh, uh, Nicene Creed that dealt with the deity of Jesus, that had to be addressed again a hundred years later in 425 AD in the Athanasian. So to answer your question, they didn't. And, and so uh, the early church was encouraged uh, and this we get from the book of Acts, to be like the Berean Christians, to search the scriptures daily to see whether the message was true, to see whether these things be, be so. Now, we have a great advantage over them. We have the New Testament canonized put there for us. These are the books that have been accepted by the church historically, okay, from the time of the apostles on. But, in the early church, that apostolic teaching, and so when we say the apostolic faith, we're talking about something really important, okay? That apostolic faith, faith means this is the faith that was delivered through the apostles. Now, Rome has a little bit different view on how that's done. But um, for, for historic Christianity, first, second century, and for Lutherans, that apostolic faith is the teaching of the apostles, the didache, if you will, uh, of the twelve, and so on. And that's what I, I would argue Paul is addressing here, and he's telling us how it was done. I entrusted it to you, oh, let me start again. I, an apostle, got it from Christ Jesus, and now I am entrusting this, I entrusted it to you, and you, in turn, are to entrust it to other faithful men. This is part of, of what it means to be a pastor. To always, as Paul, I think Paul raised this point last week, always be ready to raise up someone from the next generation and the next generation. Uh, and we, we might need to talk about that a little fuller sometime. So, one of the qualifications about these people that Timothy is to raise up are people who will be able to teach others. And um, in 1 Timothy uh, 2, that is one of the requirements of, of what, and in Titus also, it is a requirement of a pastor or a bishop. Okay? Um, Bishops later also took on an ecclesiastical uh, oversight. And so then they were uh, bishops of bishops. Okay, and so on and so forth. Um, our Lutheran confessions spell out very clearly that this was done by mutual consent. We chose one and for decency and order. Okay. Um, as we noted this morning, we're supposed to have about 65 or 70 people in these services. We had a few more. I'm not telling, but um, you know, we have to we have to think about that. Um, this is an important thing to consider in our hearts and, and minds. But they must be able to teach others. And they should uh, Timothy is encouraged to share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
And elsewhere, Paul, Paul admonishes, uh, when we suffer, we, we enter into Christ's suffering for us. And so uh, our suffering is part of that. Then he goes on to say, no soldier, verse 4, I think it's verse 4, gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Now, <laughs> just a, a little personal aside here. When I first went to Kenya, um, you are overwhelmed at the, at the humility of people, but also at their needs. Things that we take so for granted, they cannot, uh, many people in Africa. And so, uh, when, when people went down to help after the hurricane in, in New Orleans uh, several years ago, many suffered what was called compassion fatigue. And you can, you can do that very easily. You can get caught with compassion fatigue. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Tom Adlin, who was also my housemate, uh, would also remind me again and again, you need to remind yourself why you are here. I was not there primarily to deal with the physical necessities of the people around me. Civilian or student, if I can use those terms. Okay? That wasn't why I was there. And there were many needs. And when I could help, I helped. But my priority had to be on what my task was. And my task was, was to proclaim Christ to the students primarily. Primarily. We are never released from loving the neighbor. You know, that's, that's part of the second table of the law. But um, that's why it's so easy to get entangled in other pursuits uh, for a pastor or for, for people. We can get entangled in politics. If there's one thing uh, this, this pastor would do over again uh, in his pastoral life, um, I would be less involved in politics. Uh, I, <laughs> God does what God does. And um, we all need to repent for thinking we know how to run the church better than he does. But that's, that's it. And then he gives, so he gives the issue of a soldier, <coughs> then in verse uh, 5, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Um, a politician is not elected unless it's honest. You know, you can add all kinds of things in here, and you're going to lose. Because now, now we're debating on whether male athletes can, can be females in athletic events. Um, I'm sorry. People who were born as males and uh, have now self-identified uh, as females, if they can uh, participate, and so on and so forth. Um, so, this is the world in which we live. It's always been that way. It, it's just a little bit different today. Um, it is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. My, my father was a sharecropper, and I say that with tongue-in-cheek, um, because uh, before, about uh, 10 years ago, or 20 years before he retired, his retirement was, his investment was to buy uh, 100 acres of land. And when he retired, he built a house on there, and he and my mother lived there. But they had 95 acres, and my father wasn't a farmer. But he was a sharecropper. But the only way he would enter into an agreement with anyone is you provide the seed, you do the work, you get three-fifths. I get two-fifths. So if they had a bountiful season, my father was ahead of the game. If they didn't, he suffered with the farmer who had leased the land. Uh, so it's, I, I, think, I think he quoted this passage to me more than, on more than one occasion. When, when he was taught, telling me about his relationship with the person who rented the property. Um, but here's another interesting thing. Uh, having grown up in Minnesota, don't you know, Ufde um, <laughs> it never ceased to amaze me how if this was a road, 
uh, down uh, in, in the middle of farmland. When the rain and hail came, there could be a, a corn or beans on this side or wheat. Let's say wheat, that's much easier to see. And wheat on this side. One side would be just blasted and flattened and totally uh, lost. And the other side didn't, didn't even look like it was in the same county, let alone um, uh, the same story. How that happens, I don't know. But that's Old Testament too. God, God does things his way, and we don't always comprehend or understand. The, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. That, that's the prayer of every pastor, that we learn to understand how God understands. Any comments or questions on that section? <clears throat> so passing the faith down um, from Apostle to pastor to other pastors. Okay, today our system is a little bit different. Um, pastors teach the faith, and then they encourage others to go where we have what we will call more professional teachers of the faith at the seminaries, uh, so that they might have a full, well-rounded uh, life. And in, in uh, when our forefathers first came. Here, uh, many of the of these people were taught um, in what was called the practical college, which ironically started in Fort Wayne, Indiana, by Wilhelm Leia, uh, a, a German pastor, and he sent people over here. He trained them and then sent them over here, and they trained others, and eventually that all became part of what today we call the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Any questions or comments? Okay, moving on. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering. And here, Paul ties a direct connection to the proclamation of the gospel and how that leads to suffering uh, and persecution for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. It's all about the gospel. But the word of God is not bound. The word of God is not bound. We have to remember the power, powerful nature of God's word. How does God create the world? God says. How does God say? I would suggest the same way you and I do. Maybe <coughs> quite not with the same uh, dialect. Uh, he, I don't think God spoke English, but maybe he did. I don't know. He does in King James Bible, at least, <laughs> and in the ESV. But how does God call things into being? With his word. God says, and it is so. And when you think about it, this follows through the time of the apostles, it's always the word taught by Jesus, the word he has given them. And the Holy Spirit's job is to bring to the mind of the apostles everything that Jesus taught them so that they may teach and write, record for others this message of the gospel. And that is just of primary importance to us. Uh, that we understand the power that's inherent in the Word. So God reveals the Son through the Spirit. So if you're looking for the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, where do you look? Jesus. To the Word. And that is why the Word is always connected with baptism, absolution, and the Lord's Son. That way you know it is of God, and it is powerful. It comes from God. Uh, it is not the word of the pastor, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even though he speaks it. It is the word of Jesus. And that's what we have to recall again and again. That would be true also for the proclamation you hear in sermons. The proclamation you hear 
in absolution. I forgive you all your sins. Now, that's not in the Bible any place, is it? Well, actually it is, but that's beside the point. It doesn't say it in those words, it says it in other words. But if the sermon is based literally on the Word of God, then it has the power of that word as it's proclaimed. If it's based on any other word, then it's just any other word. And let me just take that one step further and say, in the last month, um, I, I received daily in my mailbox a stack of information, I'm going to call it, okay? Printed words all over the place. Most of it didn't make it inside the house. Some of them did, but most of it just got put in the trash. What's the difference between that word and God's word? God's word is real. <laughs> and it's the truth and the purity. The stuff that was coming in the mailbox was just what <laughs> You sound very cynical. <laughs> I don't know where you could have possibly gone. <laughs> <No. laughs> um, let, let me put it this way. Suppose you received an advertisement for a television set, and your television set just died, and you believe you need a television set. This word said, we have a television set. This television set is for you. Well, is that television set going to end up in your house? If it were God's word, yes. It may just sit there. You may never turn it on. You may not even plug it in. But it's still there because God said it's there. And that is what creates faith, that word, faith. Sometimes it's easy to remember that you know, the word, John calls us, the word is Christ. The word is faithful and provides a promise to us. That's what's different. We get words from everybody and everything, but they aren't faithful and they don't provide us a promise that the word does. Some of that was hard to hear, Rick, because I'm old and you didn't say that. Sorry. <laughs> the word, as in Christ, the word, is faithful and provides a promise we can say a lot of things. We say a lot of words that do not have a promise. By the way, don't jump ahead, Jeff. That's for the next person. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't wait ahead. <laughs> That's what I thought you were saying. Maybe we should because we're just about out of time, my daughter tells me. No. <clears throat> no, I have 15 minutes, hey. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the point we want to emphasize here is that the power is in the word. And the Word does what it says. Um, did you have the blue hymnal here? The blue book? No. Yeah, okay. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Um, in, in the introduction, which to my uh, stilted mind was one of the best things in that book, um, other than some of the new hymns, was uh, by Norman Nagel. And this is what he says, and it's profound. So I'd like you to remember it as best you can. God speaks in his word, and we listen. His word bestows what it says. Now Dennis can take that line into his classroom. You're still teaching first graders, Dennis? Yeah. And you can say that by changing just the word bestows to the word does. And every first grader will immediately understand what you've said. They may not agree with it, but, but they'll understand. God speaks, we listen. His word does what it says. So this morning, when, when uh, Pastor Meyer said, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that was a liturgical statement. It was a doctrinal statement. It was a biblical statement, but it wasn't a verbatim statement. And that's exactly what we're talking about, the power of the word. It accomplishes what God intends. Faith, which is God's gift to us, believes and receives that word and makes it its own. 
dimension. As the absolution is pronounced, it is a certainty that it is doing what you are pronouncing. You are pronouncing it as if Christ was standing there pronouncing it to us. It is a certainty. And faith holds on to that. Yeah. And it's real. It, it it's is, real. It, and it does what it says. It forgives your sins whether you believe it or not. The sad thing is, if you don't believe it, you have no benefit in it. You know, if, if faith doesn't receive it, it's just kind of sitting there unplugged. It's background noise. Yeah, it's unplugged. It, it, it's just there. Um, it's not connected. Then Paul, Paul goes on to say, this saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. I love this contrast. Die, live. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. What is deny the opposite of? Use the biblical term. Same say. Homo logeo, confess. Okay? Confess. Confess is the opposite of deny. And, and here again in the Greek, the interesting thing is, confess takes an activity, an action. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father. Denial takes no action. If we don't confess, we are denied. If we don't love, we hate. Yes. Does anybody else think this directly can direct contradicts itself, <laughs> like these last two lines? Well, if we deny him, he'll, he will deny us, which Jesus said, if you deny me before my father, mm -hmm. I'll deny you. Mm -hmm. Right, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And but if we are faithless, which is what we are when we deny him, he will he remains faithful. So it kind of sounds the opposite. Yes, it does. Did you catch that? You got ahead of me. I <laughs> Uh, but that's exactly the point. We would expect, if you are faithless, I will be faithless. But God is not faithless. God is faithful. So he cannot deny himself. And that's exactly what this says. God has to be God. And one of the attributes of God that we speak of all the time is faithful. God is faithful. And when we reflect that faithfulness of God to others then we are, um, in the new creation, conformed to his image once more. So we are, we are being faithful as God is faithful. And without his faithfulness, we cannot be faithful. But if you look carefully, the history of the Old Testament church is, is, is just all the time. Faithless, faithful, faithless, faithful, faithless, faithful. And, and, um, in spite of that, God stands by his faithfulness. I will do this not because you deserve it, but because I made a promise, and I will not back away from my promise to Abraham, etc. Okay, again and again we see that. So, in spite of our faithful, faithlessness, he remains faithful. And boy, <laughs> what a great blessing. And, uh, I, I remember there were times when I used that in funeral sermons uh, of people who had, from an outward earthly appearance, uh, been one of the foolish virgins. Okay? That's all I can say. That's not my call. I don't do that. And I, as a pastor, and I'm sure you're used to that too, you don't go to Lutheran funerals to hear the pastor tell you what a good guy, uh, uh, what a good person, the dead person was. But those sermons in many ways are very easy to preach because you get to say what really should be said in every sermon. We're not here to say how wonderful Mary was. We're here to say how wonderful Mary's God is. And, and, and if we do that, then we are faithful. He puts up with a lot. I wouldn't know, Mary, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> he gets up every morning and goes. <laughs> I 
Yeah. Oh my God. Did I not just have that conversation with you yesterday? <laughs> Remind them of these things. And here he's talking to those people, um, again, that Timothy is instructing in the faith, some of which may become pastors. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words. Now, what does that mean? Does it, this whole next section here is talking about the meaning of this. Does that mean um, words don't matter? No, words matter a lot. Words matter. Unless they don't matter. They either matter or they don't matter. There is no middle, uh, middle ground. But he's talking here about something else. He's talking about quibbling. Irreverent babble is another term he uses. Rightly handling the word of truth. Okay, let me give you uh, an example of not rightly handling the word of truth. Uh, on me, uh, my wife and I uh, were in the House of Parliament in London several years ago, um, and um, we were standing near the House of Lords, or in the House of Lords section of, of uh, the, the Parliament building, and they had a, a bathroom there with about a 14 high, a foot high entrance for ladies, and it opened out this way, and then you went in and there was another door inside of it. So someone came out, I'm waiting for my wife, and I'm standing there holding this door. <laughs> As, okay, now this is a 14 foot door, and so, someone, I was not dressed up. Um, I, I was in my Clark's Camp clothing. And I'm standing there, and this lady comes out, and I think she's from Texas. Now I can't be certain about that, but her accent was. And she said, well thank you sir, and in a very flippant way, I responded, ah, it is better to be a doorkeeper in the House of Lords than to sit at the Queen's table. <laughs> and she looked at me. <laughs> Where are you from, boy? <laughs> now, that was not rightly handling the word of truth. And um, because pastors have imprinted on their minds certain statements like that, they come out when maybe they shouldn't sometimes, and I always pretend I'm not a pastor at that time. Uh, yeah, where are you from, boy? Pay attention to me in the psalm. Do you want to sing the psalm? Is it in the psalm today? Yeah. The doorkeeper. The, the doorkeeper. God's firm foundation stands. Oh, uh, among them, and he talks about the ungodly. Uh, their talk will spread like gangrene. And, and here is where uh, we, we have to stop discussing quibbling and talk about when anything attacks the office of Christ, then we have to go to war. And so when anything attacks what we confess in the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, or the Athanasian Creed, every Christian, not just every Luke, every Christian should go to war. That's not equivalent. That's, in my mind, demanded of us. Why? Because false teaching is much more palatable than the truth. Whether it's false teaching about your standing before God by your goodness, or anything else is immaterial. False teaching is false teaching. Now, there's a time and a place to do this battle, and it's not always um, at family gatherings, okay? Um, but there comes a point in time where we have to say, thus saith the Lord. And I'm not going to try to spell out what that is, but Paul talks about what happens if we don't. It spins like gangrene. You don't even know you have it, and it's there. If you want us to hear you, you have to 
they're changing the word of God. Sorry, that's probably better. Um, but that it's it's not the idea that they're just chattering and, and maybe blasphemy or something. It's they're changing yeah. the word of God right. for their own purposes. And so so uh, irrelevant babble. Okay, we can kind of put up with that. But when when it's an attack, and, and this is what I would say. Uh, scriptures are very consistent about when it's an attack on the gospel, when it's an, an attack on the deity of Christ, when it's an attack on the Trinitarian nature of the deity, then we cannot remain silent. And many of us, myself included, need to repent for our silence in the last 40, 45 years regarding abortion. Either God is the creator or he's not. And as Christians, we confess that he is. So you see, those two things are bumping heads. That's not irrelevant. That's not a lifestyle choice. That's the very nature of God. Uh, so I, I think that takes us through that section. Verse 20. I want to kind of get through this so Pastor Meyer can be free to start with chapter 3 next week. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also, also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel, vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. What is Paul doing here? He's comparing the church to the house of God. And there are things that are useful, things that flow from God, things uh, for honorable use, gold and silver use, if I can use that, and some simply as wood and clay. He's not talking about their uh, the distinction uh, of wood and clay is not as valuable as gold and silver, but the one is more valuable than the other. And to be set apart as holy is uh, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee useful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. Here he comes up again. And among those controversies uh, would be included uh, the, the sort of uh, discussions about resurrection, uh, what when you're dead, you're dead, the uh, Sadducees argument versus the Pharisees, you know, and they would just go, um, I, I heard a theologian one time say this, someone can say to me, I don't believe in the power of the word. And they can say that. Well, suppose a thief breaks into your house and you are standing there with a 45 automatic. And he says to you, oh, you have a gun. I don't believe in guns. I believe in knives. Well, he can say that. But this theologian went on to say, if you pull the trigger once or twice, you'll become a believer. <laughs> okay? And, and I, I want to leave you with that thought when you talk about the power of the word. People may, may dismiss it, they may neglect it, they may look at it as, oh, it doesn't matter. Use it a few times. Pull the trigger on the word a couple of times and let the Lord have his way with it. But all, also, again, here comes this Lutheran distinction of if they're neglecting the word, they are foolish virgins, and they need to know what they're neglecting. Okay? They're neglecting the will of God. So you preach law. And then when they cry uncle, then you give them pure Jesus. Nothing more, nothing Brothers and sisters, I thank you for the opportunity to share with you the last couple weeks. Uh, Pastor Meyer gets the next two weeks, and um, 
then you can all breathe a sigh of relief as the peppercorn shall return. <laughs> we adjourn with the apostolic benediction. A question, Vicki? No. Anyone? Comment, question? If not, we adjourn with the apostolic benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with you now and forevermore.